Let the word go The forward. challenge, the opportunity to connect. The 1960s, a time of imagination and change, a time of anger and fear. The 1960s is a pioneering program called Challenge. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. That looked at our connections, our divisions, through the lens of shared values. Sixty years later, we examine our divisions, our connections, our shared pains and successes in a new program called Challenge 2.0. The Hamas attack in Israel and the counterattack by Israeli Defense Forces in Gaza have led to thousands of civilian casualties. It is a human tragedy of inconceivable scale and impact. In this episode of Challenge 2.0, will seek to move beyond the political, historical, and military aspects to focus on the human cost. We'll talk with two caregivers who have deep frontline experience in this region, gained while seeking to alleviate human pain, suffering, and need. They have performed their work at great personal risk. So on this very difficult topic, we're very fortunate to have two wonderful guests that have spent a lot of their life, a lot of their energy, a lot of their passion in this very part of the world. And so I'd like to introduce Christy Yick, who is a registered nurse and has been a medical volunteer over in that area many, many times, and I think was planning on going uh, before this whole situation broke out. And Dan O'Neill, who has been on our program before and the founder of Mercy Corps, who's done uh, wonderful work in many parts of the world under very difficult circumstances. So thank you both so much for being here. I have to ask both of you, going back to college days, mm -hmm. You had this orientation, but when did it develop, and did you have any idea that it would lead you to the places that you've gone to do the uh, volunteer work that you've done? Dan, I might begin with you on that. Well, 1968 happened, you know, with all the assassinations of RFK and Martin Luther King and the possibility of uh, Thomas Merton and those people. Mm -hmm. And it was so disruptive, and it kind of radicalized me to think about the things that matter most. But the sort of genesis of my international humanitarian direction was undergoing a war in 1973, the Yom Kippur War. Mm -hmm. And it was a major war, and I was on a kibbutz working as a volunteer. And um, I chose not to be evacuated by the State Department, and they warned me that, uh, you know, I was subject to whatever happened. Mm -hmm. But I worked during that war and it was very traumatizing. I photographed aerial combat and, and the tank battles right across the lake, the Sea of Galilee. Mm -hmm. And it was um, a wake up call for me uh, to choose a direction that had, had meaning and to do the things that matter most. Right. And to see the suffering, I lost some friends in that war, one of a guy named Aton in, in the Sinai. And I, I was damaged myself a bit. I lost some hearing and because of some air blasts that, that happened. But it shook me up in several different ways. One was just the internal trauma of the ground shaking all the time mm -hmm. and shells coming in at night. But the other was a more ideological, deeper, uh, sort of psycho-emotional commitment that began to grow. And so I started looking for ways to serve beyond that. Mm -hmm. Christy, did you have an orientation toward the healthcare professions to begin with when you went into college, or what led to that? Yeah, I think um, from my earliest memories as a child, uh, I always did want to go into healthcare, this idea of um, helping others and mm -hmm. service. So um, young girls at the time became nurses. Uh, so I, I, yeah, I think I always wanted to do it from my earliest recollection. I think my mom has a picture that I drew in kindergarten, and it was me helping someone on the ground and said, when I grow up, I want to be a nurse. And mm -hmm. I think I was five years old at the time. So, yeah. And then that led into volunteer work and going overseas. Mm -hmm. What made the connection? What was the uh, thread that drew you in that direction then? Um, you know, I first became aware of like humanitarian work overseas when I was in high school and I had seen a rerun of um, some work going on in Calcutta. Mm -hmm. Um, and that sparked an interest, you know, that the, the community where I was living um, was very small when I saw the big problems going on in the big world. And mm -hmm. I thought, well, I, maybe I could combine my healthcare experience and go over and help people. So that was my first interest. So when I graduated college, I went abroad and did some work for about three months 
And when I came back, I, I had always been looking for other ways to get involved. Mm -hmm. And it probably wasn't until 2016 that uh, a surgeon that I was working with, a pediatric general surgeon, talked about a trip that she was doing to the Middle East, to Gaza specifically. And I was very interested, and I, had, I reached out to her and I said, if you ever go again, can I go with you? Mm -hmm. And she said, absolutely. And so then I got involved with um, PCRF, the Palestinian Children's Relief Foundation. When you first heard of the attack on Israel uh, carried out by Hamas in early October, uh, what were your initial feelings? What, were, what initially went through your mind? Because you both had connections in Israel and perhaps talk a little bit about, you know, what mental imagery you had and what physical impact that had on you. Uh, Christy, do you want to? Yeah, um, of course, when I first heard of the attack on the kibbutz, I was horrified. I mean, I know what terrorists are capable of doing. Um, I had seen pictures. My friends and I had talked about it. I have um, friends who are Israeli or Jewish, and um, I was just deeply saddened by that. Uh, but there was a thought in my head that I thought, this is just another opportunity for the IDF, the def Israeli defense, just some more fuel to go in and do some destruction in Gaza. I feared immediately also for the Palestinians, the innocent pal Palestinians, what this might be for them, that mm -hmm. this was not going to just you know, go without any type of retaliation. Mm -hmm. um, because on my trips in the past, when missiles are being shot across, the disproportionate retaliation was always yeah. very aware. Mm -hmm. I was always very aware of it. I, I experienced it when I was there. Mm -hmm. um, they fight back big and hard and make. You mentioned, let me just follow up, and then, Dan, I want to get your impression on that, but you mentioned that you had some friends who uh, either live in Israel or are Israeli. Did you communicate with them? Did they share their feelings with you, or weren't you able to really connect with them at all? No, I didn't. I, I you know, being on social media, I immediately saw what was happening, and I felt this huge divide that people were feeling they needed to pick a side. Mm -hmm. So... Um, I was a little bit saddened by that because I thought, well, these are innocent children. When there's not a side here. This is human lives that have been taken, mm -hmm. hostages on the Israeli side. It's not a time to like pick a side, but this is to be aware of, um, you know, horrific crimes that are being committed. And I remember reaching out to my mom saying, oh, this is terrible. Um, and she said, you know, maybe this is a good time to start talking, right? Keep sharing what right. you know about Palestine, right? Like, let's use this as an opportunity to open more conversations. Mm -hmm. And I said, yeah, you're right. But no, I haven't been in contact with okay. anyone. Dan, how about you? Um, rolling back a, f a few minutes about how I felt when it all came down. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> Six months before it happened, I predicted to a number of people, some of whom are in government and others in my social network and my family, I said, there's going to be something really big. It's going to happen on the anniversary of Yom Kippur, uh -huh. the 50th anniversary of the Yom Kippur War. Somebody's going to launch. Palestinians and some of the Arab cultural uh, momentum of their the way they do things is they take a holiday and they, they will tee off on it like Yom Kippur mm -hmm. or Ramadan. It's also called the Ramadan War, 1973. So I, I felt that there was going to be a very major thing happened, and I told my friend uh, Ray, the doctor that I've told you about, and uh, I said there's either going to be another major intifada. Uh, the Israelis are demonstrating in the streets against Netanyahu's move against the Supreme Court. Mm -hmm. There's disruption. So the powers around them are going to fill that vacuum and take and strike while the iron's hot, which mm -hmm. they did. Yeah. So th sharing what Christy said about the IDF philosophy, and I know IDF people, including a few generals, they'll always say, well, if they kill one of ours, we'll kill 50 of theirs. Mm. So it's this upward cycle 
of violence that goes back and forth and gets worse over time. Mm -hmm. And in many of the wars I've been uh, an observer in, it's negotiations sadly don't happen until the bloodletting reaches a point of psycho-emotional exhaustion of the combatants. And they mm -hmm. just say, we've lost our equipment, we've lost people, there's prisoner exchanges that need to be done. And they just say, we need to talk. Mm -hmm. And I have been in touch with Israeli friends in Galilee who are in range of the Hezbollah rockets. I could hear the sirens on one of our calls as they were getting into their shelters. And then I've been in touch with some people I know in Gaza that are part of the Mercy Corps network of mm -hmm. young people learning to program computers and try to build peace networks, but now they're gone and the building's gone. And so it's kind of a double quadruple tragedy, so. You said you've been in contact with some of your Israeli friends and yeah. contacts. Yeah. What have they expressed to you? Well, they come off with a, you know, we will survive. We, w we will, you know, we're going to be okay. Mm -hmm. And I was thinking, Moshe, you and your family need to, to, you know, take a look at what's coming down at you. But yes, I've been in touch. Um, a, a, a hospital in Nazareth run by some French nuns mm -hmm. have asked me to help them do some, get some grants to reinforce their oxygen tanks because the Israeli government is saying it becomes a target when it's exposed. Mm -hmm. So I'm, I'm sort of in touch on that level. And I've got sources in uh, Lebanon and also in uh, Gaza itself, mm -hmm. so. So moving from that uh, view, and you worked on a uh, kibbutz. Two of them, yeah. You learned uh, Hebrew. I did. And so do you have some difficult conflicting emotions in all this as well? I'm not sure they're conflicting. They, they are co-inhabiting my mind. Mm -hmm. In other words, I have some, I learned by getting deep into the Palestinian culture on the village level, how wonderfully hospitable and generous they are mm -hmm. and gentle, but their emotions around the land and the land is important to both of them. Then they become very effusive and bombastic and upset. Mm -hmm. But I, I established relationships with PLO people, including at the highest levels. And they would sit down and sort of take off their kafia and put their feet up and then talk the truth about what they think. Mm -hmm. And then you sort of learn more by, uh, uh, you know, radical empathy, as I think I've told you, is right. one of the keys. Right. But then I, I, you know, I do speak Hebrew and I, you know, met with Israeli prime ministers and, and military and, and then just good old pedestrian folks in the, in the street mm -hmm. that, you know, give me feedback. But I identify with people as a humanitarian uh, uh, environment in which to work regardless of their religion or their ethnic uh, background. So I wouldn't say it's, it's in conflict. I mean, emotionally, that's how things cycle into violence is that you become by, you know, partisan. Mm -hmm. But I've tried to be as neutral as possible knowing what I know, but calling it as it is, like what happened in, on the border in, on the 7th of October. So obviously you've both spent time, as we've already discussed, working with the Palestinians. What were your initial experiences, and I would say not just working with the Palestinians, but getting access to do the work that you were there? And Christy, uh, just getting in there, tell us a little bit about what you had to do, and did you feel like it was being facilitated for you? to get in there and be of help. What, what were your initial experiences like there? Yeah, uh, for us to get a permit to go into Gaza takes several months. Mm -hmm. And um, the Israeli government army, they want to know everything about you. I had to tell them my father's last name, my great grandfather's last, I mean, any name they wanted. Mm -hmm. they, they wanted to know so much personal stuff about me. And I remember saying to our team leader, like, how much do I give? And they say, if you want to go in, you give everything. Yeah. Um, at the end of the day, they, they can't use it to hurt you, but they want it. Um, so it takes a long time. I mean, we were even thinking of going in March, and the conversations were already happening now mm -hmm. for permits in March. So it's a very lengthy um, process. Um, and then even when we get there, we have permits to go in, um, but there's still a lot of interrogation that goes on just across mm -hmm. the border. Uh, a lot of times they'll look at you and they'll either pretend they don't speak any English and they want you to repeat over and over again. 
why you're going into Palestine, Gaza specifically, what are our intentions. We could sit at the border anywhere from three to five hours at a time, but we're prepared for that. We know that, mm -hmm. and um, a lot of intimidation yeah. goes on. And they said, you know, just just keep answering the questions honestly. Um, so it's it it is intimidating because I kept thinking like, well, aren't aren't we working together? Aren't we mm -hmm. right allies? And it says that it's a non-religious, non. Um, partisan? Par yeah, it's a, a part, like to go over and we're helping children. It says mm -hmm. it all over and they, they can see, but they absolutely don't make it easy. And then it's just as difficult when we get out and we're back at the airport, they, they go through all our bags. They'll take anything they can that might be of use over there or they'll break it. And then they, they claim they don't know how it got broken. Mm -hmm. If you ask to speak to someone, then they say they don't speak English. <laughs> Um, the the power, the electricity has always been controlled by the Israeli side as far as water, goods. So we bring over as much as we can mm -hmm. to do the surgeries on children. So we've even tried to bring over headlights and extra batteries and things like that. And a lot of it they don't allow or when you your bags go through the conveyor belt, when you get on the other side, mm -hmm. it's it's just strewn. It's just everything is been ransacked and emptied and and part of it's on purpose oh. they are looking to make you angry and mm -hmm. so in those cases I have the benefit of just saying hey in Hebrew uh -huh. I served during a war I was on this kibbutz and then they and then they go like this you're okay you can uh -huh. come in mm -hmm. but otherwise they want to see your passport and all the stamps from all the countries you've been in well why were you in Somalia you know those kind of things what do you think is the foundation for that then uh, well, both in your case, Dan, and yours, Chris. Suspicion uh -huh. on a radical level. Um, it's highly defensive, but it's also a technique they use in, in interrogating. Mm -hmm. And they can put the heat on really big, mm -hmm. or they can just suggest a little bit. But they all speak English, pretty much. Mm -hmm. So uh, for me, I had the advantage of the, of the you know, sort of linguistic uh, ace that I could put on the table and then right. they, they would always pa just pass me through. But when I would go through in a group, did you go through in a group? Um, you know, we all arrive in um, Tel Aviv at the International Airport, but then they will call us out by name. Mm -hmm. They yeah. find us and then they call us out and then they bring us into an interrogation room. So we are removed from the masses of people on the airplane. They find us right away. In a group, what they'll do is not only what uh, Christy just said, but they'll oftentimes stack up all the, like I've taken in like 20 people at a time into Gaza mm -hmm. and uh, for different purposes, uh, uh, humanitarian things. And they want to see your passports and then when they're looking at them, then they'll stack them up after they've, and then they'll just push them onto the floor in a big heap mm -hmm. and then everybody has to scramble on their hands and knees to pick them up. So there's a little bit of demeaning of visitors and suspicion of visitors. What do you think is the uh, the motivation for them to alienate or anger or uh, make fearful visitors that are basically there to help people then? What would you say, Christy? What was your impression? I think it's a little, uh, it's this propaganda fear and anybody who has any relationship with the Palestinians, you are pretty much seen as a terrorist and um, that goes against Israel, so you know, you are seen as essentially a bad person. So why are you siding with them? They don't separate Hamas and Palestinians. Mm -hmm. They are one and the same. I believe they believe that if you voted for the Hamas and you put them into power, then you stand by them. And so us going in and helping them just pretty much puts a label on us that we are pro-Hamas. Is that yeah. your impression too? Dan? Yeah, yeah. I think it's sort of a radical bipolar thing. You're either a good guy or you're a bad guy. Mm -hmm. And I try to give resources to people like a peaceful, you know, priest who came from the village of Baram and how it was run over, run over by the 1948 Haganah, you know, or Palmach mm -hmm. fighters with the with the Israelis. And 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 his oh, I, here's where I was going. He says he, he told me once over dinner. We are the victims of the sons and daughters of the Holocaust. 
So Hitler pushed over the domino and it's still falling right now. Mm -hmm. Have you shared those uh, expressions with some of your Israeli friends, uh, yeah, Jewish friends? What, I do have. They, what do they say about that? Well, they agree basically. Yeah. And they, they you know, but they, they are, they have a vested interest in an identity that's Jewish mm -hmm. and, and even stronger in one to, quote, never again let something like that happen. Right, right. And I, you know, with Moshe, my friend, and he's such an understanding, wonderful guy, he gets it. Um, he, he told me, for example, he's, he's, pa he's passionate about human life. Mm -hmm. And when he was in the IDF, he was in a squad in the southern Lebanon border area and they were intercepting terror people coming through. Mm -hmm. And he and his team saw like three people sneaking down in toward Israel. And his guys who were armed and ready looked at Moshe and they went like that. And then he went like that, meaning handcuff them, don't kill them. Uh -huh. So they took them and they interrogated them and they let them go. But it could have been much worse. It could have been bloodletting on that day. Mm -hmm. So Moshe is, is a typical of the kind of Israelis I like to hang out with because they're, they're really interested in, in everything and they don't, they, don't, uh, they don't have this sort of anger-fueled vitriol whereby they want to slaughter you know, the enemy. Mm -hmm. so, so Christy, I might ask you, as you've been over there any number of times and you've been crossing from one side to the other, what is your feeling in terms of uh, what that's done in terms of allowing groups to dwell together in peace or building toward a conflict such as we're seeing right now? Yeah, I think, you know, both sides, they, they use this fear as a, a tactic to, mm -hmm. um, to kind of justify the wall that separates the Palestinians from the Israelis. I think each are afraid of losing the land in which they live on. Mm -hmm. um, I remember being on an airplane once and a young Israeli girl, I say young because she was in her early 20s, said, you know, what are you doing here? She was interested that we were Americans. And I said, well, we were going over to, you say Palestine. Right? Mm -hmm. If you don't want to really say, I'm going to Gaza. <laughs> so she's like, what well, part of Palestine? And I said, well, we're actually going, you know, near the seaside. <laughs> she's like, what do you mean by, we're going to Gaza? And her eyes were huge. And she said, well, aren't you afraid they're going to kill you? And I said, no, we're going over to do humanitarian work. Mm -hmm. And she said, whatever for? Well, I mean, what, what, what do they need? And I said, they need a lot, you know, medical supplies, water is limited, food is limited. And she said, by whom? And I said, by the Israeli government. The ID. She had never really heard that. She said, you know, that that wall has been put up to protect both sides, mm -hmm. the Palestinians and the Israelis for their land and that that's just for the good of everybody. And mm -hmm. I said, not necessarily that that wall is put up and it is really um, left them hostage essentially. Mm -hmm. And she's like, I've never thought about it that way. You know, She just kind of like scratched her head like food for thought that she was gonna maybe look into it more. So uh, yes, I saw it building because fear on both sides. When I talk to my Palestinian, I like to call them colleagues, you know, the other nurses and doctors I work with, what would you do if the wall came down? Mm -hmm. And they said, well, I would be afraid because as soon as we left the wall, they would kill us immediately. I mean, they're trying to kill us now. <laughs> mm -hmm. In a way, that's a little bit of protection. What would happen if that came down? And, you know, I know on the Israeli side, the fear is the same. We are defending our land because mm -hmm. if we don't defend it and we don't get rid of this terroristic group, as soon as that wall comes down, you know, you talk about a two-state or open mm -hmm. land, uh, then there's just going to be even more bloodshed. So we need to take care of it. And so I think they just keep building this idea of fear. But I think I mentioned to you, I feel like you can't be held hostage behind that a wall and have food and supplies and basic human rights mm -hmm. kept from you and not expect any type of uprising and anger. Mm -hmm. But m from what I understand, Hamas is less than 1% representation of the Palestinian people. 
and never have the civilians mm-hmm. ever, never, I've never seen them retaliate or get angry. They always say, we just want peace. We want what you want. Mm-hmm. So go home and tell your friends and family, we want the same things you want. Raise our children the right to an education, mm-hmm. to have families, and not to fear. We want that to go away. And it's, it was heartbreaking to hear that that's all they want. They don't, they don't want their children to fight in any army. They don't want them to join this terroristic group. They are also afraid of killing and death. Um, I don't know if the world sees it, that hostages on both sides. Part of that is information and information getting out and a free flow. As you said, people on both sides not really hearing what's being expressed in its totality. Uh, We've obviously just scratched the surface, the skin, Mm -hmm. if you will, of this topic. And so if you're both willing, I would like to go ahead and fold this into a second episode. But right now, thank you both very, very much. Mm -hmm. And thank all of you for tuning into this episode of Challenge 2.0. Thank you. If you've enjoyed this program, found our conversations to be informative, entertaining, and thought-provoking, and the vision inspiring of people from different backgrounds who can disagree without being disagreeable, perhaps you might consider supporting our program with a contribution. Your support will not only help our program continue, it will also support the broader efforts of Paths to Understanding, our supporting parent nonprofit organization.